Okay, good morning. I'm Rick Thomas from Moxie Community Church. And we are continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. And it's Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. Permit me to read this passage of scripture. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ since we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. The theme of Hebrews is Christ is better. And so what we want to do is we... I'm sorry for those of you who are listening. I'm trying to get my PowerPoint to work. And so what am I doing wrong here? Oh, no, stop doing that. Well, we're going to have to take it this way. Well, maybe not. Oh, come on. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. All right, I'm Rick Thomas from Moxie Community Church. The reason that we're laughing is because I had technical abilities, uh, disabilities at this particular point. All right, we're continuing in the book of Hebrews. Christ is better. And we want to talk about these verses here. Now let's connect verses 12 to 15 to the previous passages of Scripture in verses 7 through 11. So with your Bibles, take a look at that. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Now, you'll notice that this verse is mentioned again in verse 15 and again in chapter 4, verse 7. So this is very, very important. He goes on to say in verse 9, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So what's going on here? The author of Hebrews is saying, hey, look. The covenant redeemed people of God. Being led out from Egypt with many miraculous demonstrations of his power over the Egyptian gods promised them to lead them to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. They refused to listen. The very first moment of trouble, they complained to God. They murmured against God's servant, Moses. And the author rehearses these events that took place and now we come to chapter uh, two, uh, 3, verse 12, and notice, take care. 
Now, how do you avoid doubting God? There's three things in these verses. First of all, to take care. To take care. The idea here of taking care is to see something physical with a spiritual result. Now, stop and let that th sink in for a minute. To see something physical, but you have the discernment to see the spiritual perception of what is going on. And this will become important when you get down a little bit in verse 12, where it talks about an evil and unbelieving heart. So in other words, you and I can show our doubt by your halo data, by the way you look, by the way you carry yourself, by the tone of your voice, by the words that you use. But Paul, and I believe Paul wrote it, but the apostle is saying here, look, pay attention, take care. When you see the physical, there's a spiritual dimension behind it. We all play our games in communication, don't we? We all play our games in communication. Hey, how you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine. And you can look at the face. You can listen to the tone of voice. You can just see that they're not doing fine. But what do we do? Oh, I'm glad you're doing okay. Have a nice day. Talk to you later. That's not what this is saying here. In light of the previous verses and what they did, the author is saying, take care. Be observant to the physicality that you see in people with the eye of spiritual discernment. Rick, you're judging. No, I'm not. If I'm a believer, I have the ability to discern. You know what discern means? To separate fact from feeling. To look for the real issue. That's not judgmental. That's the Spirit of God opening your eyes to something in your friend's life, in a loved one's life, that they are hiding. And we have that responsibility because take a look at verse 12. Take care, brethren. Unbelieving world cannot do this because they don't have the Spirit of God, right? But we do. Every believer has the Spirit of God. You got the Spirit of God when you got saved, Ephesians chapter 1. So the Spirit of God gives you discernment, gives you understanding. That's how you understand the Scriptures, by the way. This is not something new in relationships. When you read the Word of God, He gives you discernment to understand what it's saying. Same way in relationships. But notice where the onus comes at here. Verse 12, brethren. Brethren, you and I have a responsibility in the body of Christ to look beyond the physical and try to discern the spiritual that might be taking place. Because as I mentioned earlier, we are all very adept at hiding, including me, including me. So notice now. Why? Why should we do this? Verse 12, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Why? Because we are a body. And now I want you to notice very carefully that there not be any one of you. So what is, what is, the, what is the apostle saying? He's expecting the entire body and its membership to be on the lookout for one another. It's not just the pastor's job. It's not just the leadership council's job. It's not just the job of one or two people who have been uh, uh, pillars of the church. It is all of our jobs. That's what he says here. That not one of you there not be in any one of you, what? An evil, unbelieving heart. Now, this is an interesting combination here. Now, the word heart is not talking about the organ, okay? Heart in the Bible often refers to motivation. 
drive of life. But notice the two adjectives before heart in your text. Evil, unbelieving. Now, when I say the word evil, what comes to your mind? Wickedness, terribleness, evil, murder, rape. All of those violent things that take place. Oh, that's evil. Now, it's interesting. The word means this. It means pain-ridden. Pain-ridden. It emphasizes the inevitable agonies that accompany evil. What's the inevitable agony of murder when the person is caught? Incarceration. Possibly the death penalty, depending on the state that you're in, right? The inevitable results. So it doesn't have to be a major thing. It can be lying. What's the inevitable misery from lying? You erode the confidence in your relationship with your boss. Or, worst case scenario, you get fired. And then you get a bad rep because you cannot be trusted. You track it with me? Say amen if you track it. Okay, this is important. So it doesn't have to be the big things. It can be little things. Now, who's he, who's he writing to? He's writing to Jews who have been scattered abroad. They're saved. They've been scattered abroad because of the Roman persecution, and they are struggling with staying with the faith. They find, they're, they're thinking to themselves, it would be so much easier to denounce Jesus as my Lord and Savior and just go back to the legalism of Judaism, and I will eliminate 99% of the persecution that I'm receiving. And the author is saying, you need to watch out for every one of you in your local synagogue. Don't let anyone in your synagogue desert because there is misery with that sin. If you see me sinning, what would you do? You'd call Carl, wouldn't you? You'd call Lamar. You'd call Larry, if he ever gets back from vacation. <laughs> you wouldn't come to me, would you? Why not? Well, you're the pastor. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. That is hogwash from the African-American community who distort that verse. If that's the case, then the Apostle Paul was so far out of line when he confronted Peter in Galatians. No. Matthew 18 says what? You see something going on in a person's life? You're to what? Go. Go. Not to go in judgment, but to go and try to help that person put off and put on. We all have that responsibility. We are a body. Does not your body communicate to you when you are kind of out of sorts and whack? Right? Why is it when you hit your thumb, Joe, why is it when you hit your thumb, your knee hurts? Your whole body just, rah, but you only hit your thumb. What's the deal? Because everything is connected. Now listen to me. What you do is connected to the body of Christ. You don't live unto yourself. You don't live in isolation. I don't care how far up this mountain you think you live at. You will touch other people by what you do or what you don't do. Get an amen on that one. Now, the idea of unbelieving means faithless. Faithless, without faith. And so the author is saying here, we need to be mindful within our local assembly here, in our local body, that if we see somebody who is 
physically distraught because of an unbelieving heart. Don't separate those. A Christian can be distraught because of an unbelieving heart. If I have a believing heart, am I distraught as a Christian? The answer should be what? No. Right? I should not be distraught if I'm a Christian. Because I'm related to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, the one who died for me and sanctified me, the one who gave me the Holy Spirit, the one who gives me the word of God. I should not be distraught to the point of paralyzation. Should I be concerned about the situation? But yes, only to the point of bringing it to the throne room of grace. So when a Christian gets distraught to where they get distracted, Notice what it says there in verse 12. They're going to fall away from the living God. They're going to fall away from the living God. What does it mean to fall away? To desert. To abandon. To be so convinced that they can live their life the way they want to without any accountability. That is not permissible in the body of Christ. That's what the apostle is warning these Jewish Christians about. You can't do this. And if any one of you see someone like that, you are to do something. What? Encourage. Verse 13. See it? Encourage. The Greek word is parakaleo. Most often you will hear that explained in First John 1, 9. If we sin and confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us. And the word confess is parakaleo means to say the same thing as God. But in this context, it brings up a, 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 a nuance here I want, you to, I want you to hear, okay? It means to make a call because you are close and personal. Encourage one another. Make a call because you are close and personal. How am I close and personal to you? If you are a person who has been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, you are my brother. You are my sister. That puts us in the family of God. That gives us a growing closeness. And I can encourage you what I see that you seem to be showing miseries from a faithless heart, and you're about to desert God. I can encourage you. In fact, this is a command. I should, I must encourage you. I must make it personal. A personal call. Go on in verse 13, it says this. Okay, how long should I do this? Day after day. Rick, you got to be kidding me. That guy doesn't want to see me. I'm afraid he's going to greet me at the door with a 12 gauge. How long are you supposed to do this? Day after day. As long as it is still called today. The only time it is not called today and it's when it's tomorrow and you're in glory. Did you get that? That's the only time it's not today. Today, if you hear his voice, mentioned three times, don't harden your heart. Well, Rick, I'm not in church every Sunday. You don't need to be. Whatever you receive today by the Spirit of God, if you wind up getting close to verse 12, the Spirit of God is going to talk to you today. He's not going to wait for you to come to church on Sunday. He's going to talk to you today. Now notice in verse 13, why? Why do we encourage one another? Why do we take a personal interest in one another? So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So you will not be beguiled. So you will not be deceived. You will not be tricked. 
because the world and the flesh and the devil come along and they do the bait and switch program. Have you ever had that happen? You're reading in the penny saver. Oh, we've got this sale on and, you know, it's two for one and so forth and so on. And you get down there and they don't even have the two for the one. Bait and switch, they'll sell you something else. That's what Satan does. That's what the flesh does. That's what the world does. Oh, go ahead and have illicit sex. It'll bring you so much joy. Bait and switch, heartache, pain, sorrow. Go ahead and have a little drink. It's no big deal. Heartache, pain, arrest, DUI, incarceration. There's always a price tag, listen to me, when the world and the flesh and the devil dangle something out in front of you. Always a price tag. God, listen to me, God does not tempt us to sin. Did you get that? He does not tempt us to sin. So if something comes across your mind or your emotions, and you stop and think about it, is this from God? And what your flesh or your mind is telling you to do is go out and put on Facebook, Rick is such a dumb pastor. He just... He just beats us to death every time we go to, I leave that church so discouraged and so full of despair all over Facebook. Is that God telling you to do that? I can't hear you. That's not from God. That's a bait and switch. Encourage one another. What else? Persevere. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ. That's the same idea of Christ being made like unto his brethren. He had to join humanity. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a brother or a sister to Christ. Paul puts it this way. You are a joint heir with Christ. Because we became partakers of Christ. Since we hold fast. That's our responsibility, to hold fast, to hold firm from the beginning. Many Christians, when they get saved, boy, they put to shame some of us who have been saved for 15, 20, 25, 30 years because they are so excited. They're learning so much about God's word. They're standing up in prayer meetings saying, oh, yeah, you know, I, I shared my faith, so forth and so on. And then... I hope not, but I've seen that they hang around with some of us and they don't see the same fire. They don't seem see the same enthusiasm. They hear us justifying things that we are doing or that we see in the world and we begin to damper their God-given fire. He says, look, you got on fire at the beginning. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Beloved, the goal of, uh, of us as a Christian is to be just as hot when we got saved as when we are glorified or die. Now, there's peaks and valleys. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But if you are more in the valley and seldom on the peak, you got to examine your life and find out what's going on. What's happening? What deceitfulness of sin are you believing? And as a body of community here, how are we not spotting this? Verse 12. And how are we not encouraging Verse 13. Now, he goes on in verse 15 and rehearses what we've looked at before. Who provoked God? Verse 16. For who provoked him when they heard? Rhetorical question because the apostle gives an answer. Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now, how many people came out of Egypt? Roughly about, they say, two and a half million people came out of Egypt. Remember now, 
They've been down there for 430 years. They have been multiplying and multiplying, and God has been preserving and protecting. And at the right time, after 12 miracles, 10 that annihilated the Egyptian gods, Moses led them out. And when you read about the drowning of the Egyptians and you read about Miriam's praise song in chapter 15, they come to Rephidim in chapter 17 and there's no water. And what do they do? Call a prayer meeting, right? No. What do they do? They murmur against Moses, God's appointed. Now look, when you murmur against God's appointed, you're murmuring against God. Because that's what the scripture says. Because God says, you've tested me these ten times. After all I've done for you, you test me. And beloved, you and I test God, and we forget what he has done for us yesterday, or the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before. Why do we have such short memories when it comes down to God? He never forgets a thing about you or about me. You tested me. You provoked me. That means to irritate. That means to irritate. You got anybody in your life that irritates you besides me? Huh? Maybe maybe it's somebody that, you know, repeats something all the time. They're talking to you and they, you know, 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 <laughs> I know. <laughs> Poking, irritating, agitating, picking. Who sinned against God, verse 17, and with, the, with whom was he angry for 40 years? Were the ones who disobeyed him, the ones who did not have faith, the ones who did not believe after they had been in the promised land and brought the supplies back to show to the other people, they still did not believe God. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Do you believe, do you, do you believe, do you understand, beloved? That when you doubt God, when you disobey God, you are making him angry? We don't think about that very much, do we? Well, God will understand. God knows my circumstances. Yeah, he does. And that's why he's given you solutions. But you don't want his solutions for some reason. And you are provoking him to anger. Because it says there in verse 17, was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Now watch it. When you make God angry because you disbelieve and you doubt, there is inevitable retribution, judgment, punishment that is coming. God said, I sent you out for 40 days to spy out the land and to verify what I said was true. And you came back and you brought the evidence of it but you still would not believe me. So every day you were in the land, you're going to wander one year for every day, 40 days, 40 years, and everybody from the age 20 and up are going to perish in the wilderness because he was angry with them because they didn't believe what God said after he demonstrated his power over every Egyptian god, and then wiped out the Egyptians with the Red Sea. They still provoke God, who disobeyed, verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? That's who. If you're obedient, you have access to his rest. Matthew 15 that I referred to several times gives you several things that you can do to enter into his rest. You need to take his yoke upon you. You need to learn of him. 
And he promises twice in that passage of three verses of Matthew 15, I will give you rest. But it says there in verse 18, he swore, he made a promise, he made a vow, you're not going to enter my rest because of your disobedience. Whoa, time out. So when we disobey God, he turns off the spigot of blessing. And I would suggest to you, beloved, he does. I would suggest to you, beloved, he does. Why? What kind of father, what kind of parent will go ahead and bless a rebellious, disobedient child? Would you not discipline that child? Would you not seek to try to correct that child? And that's what God does. And Hebrews says he disciplines every son that comes unto him. For God to go ahead and bless us in our disobedience would only deepen our rebellion against him and we would fashion God into what we want him to be. And no man can fashion God Almighty into what they want him to be. And God is God, and he will be who he is because of who he is. So, verse 19, we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief, beloved, is a serious affront to God. It's a serious affront to God. It's not a human frailty. It's not a cultural thing. It is a deliberate choice. Listen to me. It is a deliberate choice on my part and on your part not to believe God. And when you doubt God, you're going to forfeit his rest until you repent. You're going to place yourself in a position of chastisement until you repent. And your relationship is fractured. If you're a believer, you still have a relationship with God through Christ, but it's strained. It's strained. Why? Because of unbelief. Unbelief is a choice on my part and on your part. And in reality, beloved, can I be so blunt that when you doubt God, you are calling God a liar? I'll say that again. When you doubt God, you're calling God a liar. God tells you he can do something in his word. You come to God in prayer, I don't, you know, God, I sure hope you would do this. You're doubting. Just that prayer, you're doubting. I sure hope. That's a human definition for hope is, I really wish this could take place. I, I hope it might take place. So, Rick, how are we supposed to pray? Lord, I have confidence that in your time and in your place, you will answer this prayer. You see the difference? This morning as I was reflecting on this message, I wrote down these four things. Doubting needs to be replaced by trust. Complaining replaced by confidence. Testing replaced by obedience. Provoking Replaced by believing. So what are we going to do with it this week? Who do you know that has an unbelieving heart and is falling away from God? Who do you know? And if you don't know somebody, <laughs> where are you at in your spiritual realm of life? You might be living in a bubble if you don't know of anybody who has an unbelieving heart and is falling away. How can we not know someone like that? Unless we choose to ignore. 
So who is it? And then who do you know that is being deceived by sin? They rationalize it. They justify it. They tell you that God wants me to be happy. They tell you that God understands what they are doing. They give you a ton of excuses. They're deceived by their sin. Today, will you make a personal intervention and speak truth and hope to that person? Encourage to get involved, to draw alongside, to make a call. Now, back then, they didn't have telephones. They didn't have texts. They didn't have IMs, EMs, or whatever. They would go, they would go to the person's house. Now, I'm not suggesting that. The least way for you to personally touch a person's life is a text. That can be so misread, right? A second way that might be acceptable would be a phone call. If you can't do it in person, then a phone call. No emails, no texting, a phone call. Well, Rick, I'm on a limited telephone plan and, you know, I'm on a fixed income and, you know, if I call Australia, you know, there's going to be a price to it. Really? The price of a soul is so much of concern to you that you're making a call to Australia that you can't do that? Now, that's a fictional thing. You understand what I'm saying? And the person that you might need to talk to today is the closest person to you. A relative. And then how is unbelief hindering you from enjoying the peace of God? What area are you doubting God in? What do you believe that God can't do for you? And are you asking God to do something for you that God can't do? So what area are you doubting God? And if you understand the significance of doubting God, if you examine your own life and you're in this sphere of doubt, are you honest enough to look yourself in the mirror and say, I really don't have any peace. I got tranquility, but I really don't have any peace. I really don't have joy. What I've got is happiness related to activities or to people. How is doubt robbing you of the peace of God? That's why the apostle closes out chapter 3 with his exhortation to these Jewish Christians. I know you are in a tough place. I know it would be a whole lot easier if you went back to your religious observances that didn't develop a deeper relationship with God. I know that would be really easy for you. But God has said, and you must believe, don't desert don't be deceived by sin. Learn from your forefathers who tested me and wandered for 40 years. Don't repeat their problem. Don't come close to their doubting me. I don't want you to provoke me. You certainly don't want me to be angry with you. I want to give you rest. I've promised it to you. But you've got to come my way. And my way starts out with believing what I said. And if you believe what I said, you'll trust me 
or when I'm going to do it. Don't put me on your timetable. Because when I don't match up to your timetable, what are you going to do? You're going to doubt. And you perpetuate the cycle. This week, in particular, who do you need to make a personal call to? You see them, and they're in the wilderness. They seem happy. Yeah, they might be happy, but they don't have the joy of the Lord. And they don't, they certainly don't have the peace of God. If God showed it to you, then I think God wants you to do something about it. Amen? Don't pawn it off on somebody else. And if God showed it to you, and I'll close with this. Listen to me. If God showed it to you, he'll give you the strength to speak what needs to be spoken. You're not responsible for the result. You're not responsible for the fallout. Just be obedient. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this reminder this morning. It's so easy, unfortunately, for us to fall into doubt. All we have to do is take a look at our world and listen, listen to the flaming liberals or to other people. Where is your God? If your God is loving, why does he permit this to take place? That was the very question that was raised in Paul's day. We come back to the fact that these Israelites waited 430 years to be brought into the promised land. God kept his word. And you will keep your word to us. And as we obey, as we replace complaining with confidence, we say, not my will, Lord, but yours be accomplished. Help us this week to live in such a way that our lives exemplify belief and trust. May the Spirit of God find freedom and that we might listen to his voice pointing out to us. You're getting awful close here to doubting God. You're getting awful close to turning away from God. You're getting awful close to believe the deceitfulness of this sin that we would quickly shun, run away from, abandon, desert. That's what we need to desert, not you. Strengthen us, O oh God, as your children. Bring this message back to our hearts and minds. I pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. Have a good afternoon. For those of you who might be joining us Sunday night, we are talking about Jephthah. Did he really sacrifice his daughter?